I, I want to spend just a moment talking about publishers. Some of you may be interested or not, but uh, today everybody is writing a book. And once you write the book, trust me, that's the easy part. The difficult part of the book is publishing. First of all, it's very difficult to find a publisher unless you spend a lot of money self-publishing. So I self-published my first book and I swore I'd never do it again, mostly because it cost you money to market that book. Once you buy from a publisher a book that's going to be published, you know, they don't market that book for you. You have to go and find ways to do book signings and you know, it's very complicated. The other way to publish, your, publish a book is with a, what they call a bona fide publisher. Now those are people you send your manuscript to and if they like it and they run it through a whole bunch of committees and tests and say, you know what? We'd like to publish your book, then they pay you. The thing about that is that's not very nice either because when they pay you, they're in charge. So I've had this issue before. Uh, my, my, the other book I had besides the self-publishing was uh, published by History Press in London. And I got to tell you, I, I re I'm Irish. I don't mind the, I love the English. But the English publishers I didn't care for. You know, they, they ruled everything. You can't put this here. You can't put that there. I don't like this copy. Move it here. It, was, it wasn't. never heard of the book probably not and i wouldn't blame you it's called ships to remember this latest book which also i found a publisher in new york not self-published but i like these people in new york and they wrote me a very nice letter saying that this book deserves to be published and they'd like to do it that's neat copy to get that means that you have a chance of getting your point of view across and how you want to have printed what took you five years to put together. So I have been painting. Can we show? By the way, did I thank everybody? Carl, and Shelby, Dustin. I want to thank Libby with an IE. That's the female spelling. And uh, Dennis for coming, my favorite nephew. But I do want to thank those people. He really did help put this thing together. Before I show you the next slide, or the first slide, I want to say that if I see you nodding off, I will totally understand. When I was teaching at Burnley, I had 30 students in the class. This would have been 30, 40 years ago. I had 30 students in my class. And I remember one man in the back and he had dozed off. There was a young lady next to her and I said, well, excuse me, would, would you mind kind of waking him up? And she said, why don't you do it? And sleep? <laughs> do I push this? I have to always come over here. I'm not good at electronic. If I screw this up, we won't have a show. Oh my God, something happened. If you can see this, it's a tugboat. There's a tremendous fire. The ship in the background, which you can't read the copy, is called the High Flyer. The ship to the right, which is just the stern of a ship that just exploded, called the SS Grand Camp. You have to think about the time of day. It's eight o'clock in the morning. It's the 16th of April, 1947, two years after the war. America had given these Liberty ships to France. They gave them to France because Europe was falling apart and America wanted to help build the country. So they gave them ships, all these Liberty ships. And these two Liberty ships were next to each other in the harbor in Texas City. Now, right down the confluence from them is Galveston. 
So we're talking about a really wide area confluence of water that goes right into the Gulf Coast. It's a beautiful morning, it's eight o'clock. The wind is kicking up at six knots, which isn't good by the way. And they were loading on this boat from the night before, which was half loaded sodium nitrate. We all know sodium nitrate is the same fertilizer that blew up the Oklahoma building with McVeigh, remember that? Took half the building away. There were 350, 2300 tons of ammonia nitrate loaded onto the ship. There was another 2000 tons loaded on the high flyer. We're talking about a lot of no ordnance here. There was sulfur, 16 crates of ordnance and ammunition. I mean, we were loaded for bear here. We're talking if this thing's going to be equivalent of probably a two kiloton bomb. It was the greatest explosion that took place man-made in the United States, even to this day. It was enormous. A lot of people don't know about Texas City. I'm talking 1947. I wanted to talk a little bit about the tug. This tugboat Guyton, they were from Galveston. And they asked for volunteers, the company of this tugboat come. they asked for volunteers. And do you know, they had hands galore. They had more people than they had tugboats. These people volunteered. They knew what they were getting into because the first boat had already exploded. The first ship had already exploded. So here they are coming down from Galveston, which is just up the waterway, little ways. And they come in and their first order is just three tugboats. It's to try and put the fire out. I got news for you, it's too late. What happened to the first boat, the Grand Camp, was that the stevedores noticed that the bags that they were putting on were getting hot to the touch. Now, sad things happen here that shouldn't have happened. All the signage on the boat that talked about pas de fumée, don't all in French. So the stevedores had no idea here they are smoking around this explosion that's the same as atomic blast. Now the Coast Guard later on said, what happened where probably what happened was to ignite that, although this stuff will self-ignite at about 550 degrees, give you some idea. Ro wood ignites at about 600 to 800 degrees. Now 650 is not a lot, this stuff was getting hot. All it took was probably, as the Coast Guard said, probably a cigarette. Now you have to remember then they also had sulfur on board. And the captain of the boat could have put the fire out with water. But he didn't want to because water would ruin the fertilizer. We're talking about a lot of money here. So the captain refused to do it. He closed the hatches and said, let's pump in some steam. That should cut down the oxygen. What he didn't know was that this kind of fertilizer creates its own oxygen. So steam didn't curb anything. It was no time before the hatches blew. Before I talk about the actual explosion, I'd like to give you some insight into a letter that I got from Texas, from Galveston, Texas. I had to locate the tug company so I could write about them. So I could find out who were the people, what did they do? And I get a call. I, by the way, I found the tugboat company and I sent them a gicle of my painting, full size. I didn't frame it. And they said they'd love to have it. I get a call from a lady in Galveston. She said, I, I just happened to be in a frame shop and I watched a woman in front of me having this painting framed. And I had to tell her, dear God, my father was there. 
he was in that explosion. We're talking 1947, I'm talking about six years, seven years ago. So she called me and told me this and said, I want you to talk to my father, Charles Delgado. He's 87 years old. I talked to him for a while and he didn't want to say much about this. I was asking him questions, go up wherever to see him. And his daughter, Teresa said, do me a favor, I'll send you an email. I'll send you all the information, newspaper clippings, everything. This is great for an artist and a writer because this is called research. And really 80% of writing a book has to be, I think, for me anyway, research, because I'm not that knowledgeable. She sends me this email and Charles Delgado was 18 years old and he wanted to skip school that day. Three of his buddies agreed to go with him. And on the way to where they wanted to go swimming, they saw this great beautiful orange plume that was caused by the sulfur that they had on board. No explosion yet, just plumes, fire brigades, people around. People, it's amazing people, huh? We talk about chasing ambulances or fire brigades when we're kids. These people come back out of their offices and say, look at all this smoke at this going on. No idea what was on board, you know, all standing around. Delgado and his three friends, Charles uh, Delgado, he gets down to where this is all happening on the dock. And he decides to go back to the car and get the hell out of here. Well, one of the young men stayed behind, an 18 year old lad, high school kid, and he stayed behind. And by the time Delgado and the other two people got to the car, the explosion rocked the ground that they stood on. For two square miles, it took out and annihilated everything. Two miles away, the anchor landed. Charts of molten uh, steel in the air like snowflakes, only it was hot molten steel, like it's snowing. They managed to get under the car and when it was all over and the ground stopped shaking, and the roar stopped and they came out into this mist, this white mist of people staggering around like zombies. And they were asked by some people who were still in charge around and survived if they wouldn't mind taking some of the bodies to the morgues. There's nobody left. When they got to one morgue, Charles Delgado said they saw his friend on the table. And the letter said Charles didn't recognize his friend by his features, but by his clothes because his head was gone. So she said he couldn't talk about, he still can't talk about it. In the meantime, this explosion knocked two airplanes out of the sky. Two airplanes disappeared, you know. As far away as Colorado, they could register this quake of sorts that was going on. 20 miles away, people, windows were broken out. Remember what they had on the, this was one of the 10th largest harbors in the United States because of all the war shipping. So we're talking about a lot of tanks of fuel and tanks of oil and tanks of aviation fuel, all kinds of munitions. So Texas city disaster. I couldn't believe when I read this story and wanted it to be the cover of my book. I couldn't believe that people in the United States wouldn't be taught this in school someplace because people really did go out of the way to help one another. We had two towers go down in New York, a lot like that. A lot of people coming in to help. We Americans tend to do that when things go bad. We all forget our differences and we all get in pitch in. Anyway, there was a tidal wave and uh, the tidal wave was 20 feet high and it pushed the tugboats to the far side of the waterway. 
and not one single guy on those tugs died. This shows the tugboat Guyton, who's shining a light on a person. Can you see him coming down on the anchor chain? They don't know what happened to him, but they did remark that there was a person that they did see in a blue shirt. So I had to paint that. So probably the last time they saw him because what happened to blow the tugs away was the next ship just blew up. Same amount of fertilizer. Tremendous double whammy, Texas. And I just, because I love Texas, and I thought, God, eh? no wonder those people are so nice, you know? They, just, you know they, they must understand a lot of the hazards that go on when we live in cities, and these things can happen. So I love the people from Texas, and uh, I do want to close with, once again, tugboat people survived. What they were trying to do was pull, using the anchor chain, that boat off the harbor because there were more fuel dumps there. Once again, to finalize this, it was the Coast Guard that said, you know, that was come in at the last minute. They were very helpful in the beginning that they get the fireboats out of there, wasn't working. So tugs went in afterwards. Tells you something about those people, not to say the Coast Guard, they were told to get out. Tugboat people aren't told in, they go in and do what they have to do. So this book is about boats of wood and men of steel. This book is about people who work on these tugs and save lives. The next, do I push it again? Or do I bring it? Oh, gee, that's so, that's amazing. <laughs> it just came up. That's a steam engine I built, I was about 10. So my interest in maritime and my interest in maritime related only to cinema, movies that I could see about this stuff. Because although I was in Dublin, which would be considered a maritime area, I don't think so. <laughs> Not during the war, we didn't have a lot of maritime, we didn't have a lot of money. My trouble was finding parts to build this thing at 10 years old. And just to go through it rather quickly, I better move fast here. Just to go through it rather quickly, uh, the hardest thing about building this little engine was finding the piston, the cylinder and the piston. I couldn't afford to buy one, didn't have to, where the hell would I find? I remember ingenuity, yeah? My sister used to put all this, this lipstick on with this brass tube. And when she pushed the bottom of the brass, another brass tube came out with the lipstick and she put the lipstick on and then she pulled the little brass tube come back in. So I found my cylinder. I dumped her lipstick, got into a lot of trouble because she knew that steam engine had her lipstick cylinder on it. We could go to the next one if we want. Uh, okay. So we're still talking, I suppose, about the power of steam. It's difficult to talk about the power of steam without talking for a moment on those, usually men, sorry about that, just happened to be, uh, who built these steam engines. A lot of people think that James Watt built the first steam engine. I wonder how many people think that. I did. My mother was a Scot. She told me, just remember, it was James Watt that build a bloody steam engine. <laughs> Which is so emphatic, so strong, so Scott. I, if I didn't believe her, it would be the old dishcloth on the bus. <laughs> she was wrong. It was Thomas Newcomen who really designed the first steam engine that worked in a boat. Now there was an American named Fish that I read about but his steamboat didn't do much, carried a few people. What we were looking for and what I was looking for was the first, the first steamboat that could be considered a tugboat. This is Scotland at the turn of the century, a little after the turn of the century. The reason we know it's a little after the turn of the century is I remember the Firth of Forth, my mother being a Scot, 
my picture was taken with her when I was a child by this bridge. You'll notice there's this, a, uh, a steam engine, a locomotive going over the bridge. Locomotive really weren't created until about 1804, 1805. So this had to be much later when, when they did this. But this just shows typical ships that were part sail. I suppose you could call them hybrids. They were hybrid ships. They were part sail and part steam. So uh, I also showed the paddle wheeler, which in those days, they were just beginning to develop. The thing about the paddle wheeler had, had engine, two engines. They could turn on a dime. That's why that they were really amazed they could do this. Can we have the next slide? How do we do this? Oh, look at that. I, I'm going to move through these a little faster. Okay. Ah, this is Scotland. Scotland the Brave. Uh, I have a sign up there that really says New Bedford, but they had a New Bedford place in this part of Scotland. Where this, this typifies what happened at the turn of the century where ships that were sail ships were being modified into steamships. It really did revolutionize industry, didn't it? Turn of the century, the steam engine. Steam engine revolutionized industry and especially maritime. The thing about this painting, I also painted it for another reason. Uh, the name of the ship, I can't even see it from here. Uh, I probably made it up, but that painting was designed to be the Pequod. Anybody know what the Pequod was? Yes, indeed, the Moby Dick, the story in Melville. So, uh, Steam replaces sail is the title of this painting. And the white horse to me represented the white whale. So the painting has all different kinds of significance for me. Could I have the next slide? This, this was the Charlotte Dundas, the very first tugboat ever designed. Scotland. 1802, William Symington had built an engine, but he didn't use the, his engine in this boat. He used the James Watt engine in this boat. The Charlotte and was was uh, designed and named after Lord Robert Dundas's daughter, Charlotte. And he was a member of the Clyde uh, community who dealt with the canals in Scotland. Anybody know what a towpath was? We talk about going down a towpath. Well, you know, a towpath is usually beside a canal. And a lot of people think the towpath was a walking path for a horse, T-O-W path. So the horse, before this, tugboat came along, the horse used to pull barges. Remember how much more a barge could pull and load and deliver than a horse and a carriage. What's interesting about this is the horses were significant because somebody asked James Watt one time, where do you come up with horsepower? HP, we use it all the time for engines, don't we? Where in the world did you come? What the hell does that mean? Right? We, we, you're trying to define the strength of an engine, the power of an engine. And he related it to horses. The pulling power of a horse, the weight that a horse could lift, all those, all his thoughts were based on horsepower. Uh, this engine, I think had about a 350 horsepower, it's pretty big. Half of the engine was on deck, and she was built to be on the canals and tow barges and get rid of the horses. Horses can pull someplace else. It was great. And she actually pulled two barges for 20 miles, notwithstanding a tremendous gale the whole way. And she drove seven knots all the way to her destination in a gale. Ah, 
gale on a canal. It's not like, listen, it's not like being on the North Sea, <laughs> you know, but just the same. There was a lot of power going on, a lot of pressure. So they took that they were almost 20 miles, two big barges. So she was indeed the first tug because she, what's the tug do? They have pushers and they have pullers. They tow and they push. They tow large ships, they tow barges. Yeah. What's sad about this is it only lasted about a month on the canal in Scotland because the canal authority said that the wash, now remember her width, by the way, was 18 feet. Right? That's something to consider for a moment. We're talking about a canal. How large, I wish, what's his face was here, Charles Fawcett. How large are the canal boats in England and Scotland? Or, yeah. The width, anybody know? Can't be more than six feet. That's what they, that's why they're six feet wide and 400 feet long. You know, amazing. It takes you a week to get from one end to the other. <laughs> but that's how they are. She was 18 feet, took up almost the whole freaking canal. So the authority said, you are washing, your wash is washing away our banks out of here. A beautiful boat. And it ended up doing a little work in, uh, in Glasgow, but not much. She was really put out on one of the estuaries, one of the small canals, and she was left there to rot. Her ribs, her ribs are still sticking up out of the dirt today. I did see from people, friends in Scotland, they sent me pictures, just the ribs sticking up. The f I mean, famous boat, our first tug boat, gone. Okay. Uh, by the way, she was about uh, her width, she was 56 feet with an 18 foot beam. That was the Charlotte Dundas. Did we have the next? Libby, how many people recognize that boat? Well, I have a story to tell you about that. I don't know if you know what it's like growing up in a place like Dublin after the war, but it's not that much fun. Dublin was just fraught with poverty. There were no jobs, no work. We didn't have a lot of food. Food was being shipped elsewhere to government. So we lived uh, in a rather poor quarter and uh, a way to get a reprieve from the cloak of poverty would be to go to the cinema. That's the only way, entertainment. It was the only way to get away from the way you lived every day. The fact that you didn't have a lot of food, the fact that four people were sleeping in a bed, the fact that you all slept in one room, cold water, and a fireplace that you could find wood, and a bit of a stove, gas stove. So you can imagine my love with the theater. I mean, all the brothers were courageous, all the Errol Flynn movies, you know, the uh, pirates. And my mother took me to a movie that I will never forget. The, the movie was called Tugboat Annie. She took me, I loved American movies, especially American. And I must have been in awe. I mean, I would say I was there. I was with Tugboat Annie. She wasn't a very nice person, but she wasn't bad. Wallace Beery, played her husband, a drunk, a lout, a no good, an ugly man. I didn't care for him. Uh, Dressler, Marie Dressler played Talk About Annie. The movie was great. I wasn't in love with either of those featured characters. Who was I in love with? Narcissus. Who was Narcissus? The frigging boat. I love that top cylinders this big here. God, I could put my arms around them. I was so impressed with this boat, Narcissus. Now you can imagine, how did I know that 60 years later, I'd have an office up in the AGC building, 
and I'd be looking out the window, looking at Narcissus. Foss bought the boat and called it the Arthur Foss. Now, what's the Arthur Foss doing escaping from Wake Island? Anyway, by the way, you can imagine my feeling. By the way, I did take my wife back to Dublin and we had a little bit of money to spend and we had some fun. And I wanted her to see the cinema, the green cinema, where we used to see all these great movies that really excited me to do what I want to do, which is write and paint maritime. And it was a big marketing place, like, you know, I don't know, where people go and shop for all kinds of goodies and stuff. And I felt lost that my cinema was gone. In 1940, Excuse me, yeah, 1941, she was taking material from Hawaii to Wake Island. Why? They were anticipating war and they wanted to build an area where they could have a runway and have equipment, have military personnel. They wanted this island to be militarized. She was very important getting concrete and goods and woods and stuff. And the Justine Foss went with her. I believe the Justine Foss had to be towed a little bit or filled up with fuel because small, much smaller boat. The day that they left Wake Island was the day that they learned that Pearl Harbor had just been bombed. You can imagine the crew here. They were pulling a barge. They didn't know what to do. Didn't know what to do. They, they didn't know if America was gone. It sounded to them like, and they could also get Japanese radio. You know, a lot of times they were being spoken to in a very good uh, American or English accent where they're saying, guess what, you're Americans, you're gone, you're history, you know. But these people were very, very concerned. They did paint the uh, ship with black oil so that it wouldn't be lit up like a Christmas tree. And they got away with that. I'm not sure if they were reconnoitered by a Japanese plane. I put that in there. I don't know because it kind of defines the period of time for me. They did make it to and win all kinds of medals. They, I don't know why, but you know, they, they, they made it and were heroes. I mean, they didn't do anything they wouldn't normally have done. You know, they're getting home, for God's sake. Justin Foss, on the other hand, was captured when the Japanese invaded Wake Island. One of the, the captain of the Justine Foss and a couple of guys on that boat were given an opportunity to go to a labor camp in Japan, which saved their lives because everybody else on that island, the workmen, the people who were confiscated, the people who had to work for the Japanese on that island, finish things off, make it Japanese, and the crew, for the time, the island was rescued by the Americans. They found all of those people shot dead. Another one of them. So the young captain who was uh, Foss in Japan was shipped back. I think his father was a big shot admiral from met his dad. They were very happy to, to, to do that. It was, it was quite a story about that ship. So that is one of my favorites. Got the next. Uh, I better move it along real quick here. I'm sorry. Um, you must remember this. Here we go. Ah, oh, that's the Arthur Foss today, isn't it? I mean, that's how she is in Seattle, happy. Not the same, not the same craft, but nonetheless, she's called the Arthur Foss. And here I like to paint. I actually, uh, there were, number of people in town that wanted to build a new, uh, a new, uh, what do you call it, aquarium? And they asked me if I would build one into the painting, uh, which I did. All this glass goes all the way beneath the surface and they had two great whales with water coming over the tail because they couldn't afford to do what I wanted. So it never happened, but they liked it. Uh, anyway, back to the next slide. Dustin, thank you. Oh my goodness. I'll go through this fairly fast with you, okay? 
Halifax, 1917. Very much like the Texas City disaster, really just as bad. This ship, the Mont Blanc, another French ship, was carrying tons and tons of aviation fuel, tons and tons of ammunition and other goodies. And she was coming into Halifax to await a convoy. So she was going to come in and wait there and then leave and join the convoy for Europe. At the same time, she made it a little late. She got to Halifax and the harbor late and they had a submarine net, net and that net made her stay overnight. Next morning, it was lifted. The pilot came in to drive the boat and they drove that boat up the Narrows in Halifax. And had they gotten there the night before, this wouldn't have happened. There was another big ship called the Emo uh, who was going to New York to pick up material for Belgium, to bring stuff into Belgium. So they would come back later and meet it. So here we have two boats going in alternate directions. But this is what's interesting the Coast Guard found. First of all, they found that the Emo, which was a very large ship, that's her right over there. Can you see her? And it says Belgium relief on Jesus. <laughs> I can't read anymore. <laughs> anyway, the Emo was an enormous ship. My story is about the Stella Maurice, which is a tugboat. Tugboat was devastated, all hands dead. What that tugboat was trying to do was douse the flames on this ship after the crash and also pull it so it wouldn't land on the dock and cause damage. They were trying to get it out into the middle. The crew, the Coast Guard wondered, why didn't the crew just drop anchor? All the fuel drums for the aviation fuel was right in front of the mechanism that got the anchor up. The pilot, who is from Halifax, says to the captain, hey, we better fly the Red Baker flag here, let people know that if anything happened to us, everything's going up. And the captain said, no way. If I fly that Red Baker flag, there will be terrorists, saboteurs, and they will fire on the ship. And nobody knew what they were carrying. The Emo wasn't, she wasn't carrying anything. What's interesting is spectators said that the Emo had now what's the usually what's the speed in an area like this we all know don't we? it's around six knots isn't it i mean that's your that's your maximum speed in these areas the emo had a bow wave why was she in such a hurry she didn't know that the other ship there was no communication was coming this way so what does the mont blanc do the captain who's very familiar with the area one sound port to port get your butt over this boat couldn't go to the left because they knew that they would be having that wasn't the way to pass at the same time they couldn't go to the right because it was just a landmass under there and they would go aground the emo was over right in front of them and should have moved to let them pass port to port but she didn't do it and by the time they tried to stop you know how long it takes to stop one of these crates, don't you? Some of them, if, if they're even, even eight, nine knots, two miles, they weren't stopping. So the Emo tried to move out of the way and clip the bow of the Mont Blanc. And when she clipped the bow, the spark created a fire. And what was up on that deck? Aviation fuel. So we're talking big fire. No real problem yet. Hasn't gotten into the munitions yet, but there's an enormous fire at the bow of the boat. Stella Maurice finds out about this and they get right on it, the crew, and they come in with this. Stella Maurice means, what does it mean? Stars, star, or Maurice, star, Stella. Anyway, she tries to pull this ship out of the way, but she can't do it. She stays with the ship all the way to the dock. 
and it explodes. Again, we're talking about the same situation that we had in Texas. Enormous explosion. Two miles took out half the city. The emo was thrown across into uh, Dartmouth, which is part of the Halifax at the other side. It was an enormous explosion. People were incinerated. They had a new fire truck that they brought in while the fire was up at the bow, gone, incinerated, nothing left. People gone. It became really a, a center for blind research. And why do you think that was? What happened was people came to their windows again to look at the beautiful, colorful plumes of smoke in front of the children in a school, all of them up to the window. Nobody said, get away from the windows. They didn't know it was going to blow up. The biggest incident of eye damage in the world happened that day. Shards of glass. Ophthalmologists and oculists came from all over the world to help. Enucleation is the removal of an eyeball. And there were more enucleations that day than anybody had ever seen in the world. People were fortunate if it was one eye, but two eyes, you're blind. An hour ago, you were fine. Now you're blind as bad. So they really, people came and really tried to help from all over the world. And it did become a center for that kind of surgery. It's a complicated surgery. I read all so, so I could learn about it. It's not that easy at all because you can really damage the nerves and you could have pain in that eye that isn't an eye for the rest of your life. Also the vestibular nerve, they tried to keep just in the event that they might be able to, you know, solve some problems. But anyway, let's keep going. Okay. Again, I'll try and keep this quick. This is really a story about the Caird. The Caird is a small boat, much like that little boat out there that's a steam engine out there, and the Caird wasn't a steam engine. But the Caird had uh, six passengers on it. Shackleton, Crean, Wolseley, guys fr from the ship, which was the Endurance. This Endurance, you can see it's starting to get into iceberg territory. The Weddell Sea at this time of the year was the worst. She left England in 1914 at the outbreak of the war. She was in a three-masted barkentine. Uh, she was 144 feet. She had a 350 horse engine that pushed her at 10 knots, which really wasn't bad. And she also had to sail. When they got into the Weddell Sea, they were beset by ice. We all know the story. You've seen lately, they, they found the ship at the bottom, big icebreaker went in. Just to give you some comparison, you know what the, the engines on the icebreaker that went in, the horsepower? <laughs> Just to give you some idea, 16,000 horsepower. She had 350, four foot uh, prow, and pushing through this ice. Problem was she pushed herself right into a mess. It was the worst year for ice in the Weddell Sea. It was a hundred miles of ice. They couldn't find land, they couldn't go in, they couldn't they had to just sit there. Shackleton, the thing that gets me is Shackleton was told when he bought this for great, I mean, she had some 14 inch bags. Nothing's gonna destroy this ship. He was told, I read in a note later by somebody who knew him, said, don't take that ship into ice territory. Why? Because she was what they call hard walled. Now a hard walled ship is a ship that comes straight down almost to a chine and just goes underneath, hard walled, no curvature. The other kind of a ship is called bold 
a BOW LED bold bottom or bowl bottom ship, a round uh, bottom. They have a tendency to be pushed up by the ice. This guy, whoever told him, was right because she didn't get too far, but she was crushed. I don't know, nine months, eight, nine months. They lived on the ship for a long time, then they had to get off because she finally went to the bottom. Uh, after an hazardous journey, they found Elephant Island. They lived on penguins. Now, when they took off, they had 27 sailors and Shackleton. 69 dogs and a cat called Miss Chippy. The reason the cat was called Miss Chippy, who was shot later, was because she belonged to the Chippy, who was the ship's carpenter, McNeish. These 69 dogs, when they were stranded and they took the dogs with them, were eating more than the 28 people. So they shot them. Now, these dogs were truly their best friend. There's no doubt even one guy in his diary writes and says, I, the most horrible day of my life was shooting my pet. I can think of people on this boat I'd rather shoot rather than my pet. They ate 49 dogs. The others had been shot thinking they were just eating too much food. They didn't want to eat them. They just wanted to get them out of the picture. After penguin, I got news for you, dogs would have tasted pretty good. I don't know if you've ever eaten a seal, but it is the ugliest meat that you could ever eat. You could get sick on it. Probably good for you though, you know, but fish oil, kind of, you know. They had pelican under glass. They had oil that they got from the seal so they could make fires. But Shackleton knew they weren't going to live long. They were not going, so he had to get out of there. That, thus, the 800 mile track. Could we see another? That's the Caird, which was named after one of the sponsors of the trip. The Caird is now in London. It's beautiful. She had two masts. What they did was they took three boats off of the Endurance, small boats. They used one as a shelter underneath, but they all survived under there. It's amazing, nobody died. One guy who was a stowaway, they made him into a cook, they didn't send him home. He lost his big toe, frostbite. They had to cut it off. Just a thought, you know, when they, when they cut off gangrene or they cut off frostbite like that, they gotta find good meat. <laughs> I leave you with that thought. It's not nice. They had a hell of a time, 800 miles two fierce storms. The second fierce storm that they encountered sank a large steamship. Didn't sink them. They were like corks bobbing up and down the water. They only had food for 30 days. Shackleton did this on purpose because he knew that after 30 days, they weren't finding South Georgia Island. So they would probably die. After 17 days, they finally saw kelp in the water. What does kelp mean? Land is close by. Kelp doesn't grow out in the ocean out there. It's usually on rocks and stuff. Can you imagine them waking up? I wonder, holy God, kelp and seabirds. Land. And sure enough, it wasn't very nice land. They had to, the first night they had to back off in a storm because they were being thrown into rocks. They finally found a little base called Hacken Bay, which on the south side of the island, miles from the camp on the other side, which is what they were trying to get to. So three of them took off over the mountains and made it to the camp. The people at the camp in South Georgia Island couldn't believe that what they were looking at, these folks. What's the next shot? Is there another shot? Shackleton spent a lot of time looking for, but he tried twice and didn't make it both times. 
both tugboats that he picked didn't make it. Fierce seas, round the horn, turn back, get the hell out of here. He is worried about his man. What a character. See, he's an Irishman. I gotta say that. Born in Ireland. English people. English people. <laughs> anyway, he found this Brazilian tugboat called the Yelcho. And they made it. The Captain Pardo, neat guy. Again, around the horn, they almost turned back. And Pardo said, we can make it. They have no radio. A 350, another 350 horse. Only this boat could do 14 knots with 350 horse. Probably by that time, they may have had a, a, what they call an expansion, in which would be two cylinders pushing. I don't want to get a fuel engine. I don't want it to create superheat. So she could go a little faster, a little more powerful. When he got off on the boat, he was known. Somebody said, oh my God, look what he's doing. He was counting the men. There had to be 22 men. And he cheered because they were all there. A lot of them afterwards got back to England, joined the war, many were killed. And I was in a pub in uh, County Kerry, but they have to call it the North Pole. I found it by mistake. Another story, but you know, uh, most of them were killed in the war. They went right into the war. Remember, 1916, war still on, another two years. What's the next one? Uh, okay. It's, it's time, you know, when you all want to go to bed. So real quickly, uh, Dunkirk. The thing about Dunkirk, I want to say, is I, I watched the movie just for the hell of it. Wrong. It was wrong. I wanted to see the movie so maybe I could learn some things from, paint some things. They had this hospital ship exploded with all these men in the water. Never happened. That same hospital ship didn't make it in to Dunkirk Harbor. It was way outside the harbor and it was strafed by a Messerschmitt and was towed back to London. So you could, these guys who make these movies up, there was a better movie if you ever want to see it, it made in 1951 with Tom Mills called Dunkirk. That was accurate. This ship was even in it, this tugboat rather. It's not a tug, it's really a, it's a water vehicle. They use it uh, on, on the uh, Thames to put out fires and other ships. Mm. Like, phenomenal little boat. She went into Dunkirk and saved 500 men and coming back actually towed other ships who had been mined. That little boat, the Massey Shaw, was absolutely amazing. I'm going to go fast here. What's the next one? Oh, geez. Roy, this is your boat. This is the Ontario, it was a tugboat. And when Pearl Harbor was bombed, the tugboat was in mothballs. Not really, but she was getting a new, it used to be a steam driven tug. And she was getting a new diesel. But right away, she was ready to go with the new diesel. And the only thing these guys added to that boat was a 50 millimeter, millimeter machine gun. And that crew went out there at Pearl Harbor and shot down a Messerschmitt. So in my opinion, that boat called the Ontario was a very famous tugboat. She did other things, which I'm not gonna talk about because we don't have a lot of time. What's next? Oh dear God. <laughs> How many people here knew that New York could have been wiped off the map? New Jersey, Bayonne, Brooklyn shipyards, gone, annihilated, evaporated. You see the Brooklyn shipyards during the war, and this was 1943, uh, this book, the Elastero, which was filled with munitions. On the dock, they had train loads of munitions. And for some reason, they had a fire on board in the bilge. 
and she was ready to go up. It was also a holiday. It was in April and it was a holiday, Christian holiday, and half of the men weren't there who should have been. There was a great call went out for volunteers, Coast Guard, anybody who was around there. They didn't even have time to get the, the freight carts off the deck were full of ammunition. They called in the Coast Guard. These two very famous tugboats uh, tried to put the fire out. In the end, that wasn't working. And the fear was that if this ship goes up like it did in Halifax, this is going to be much bigger than Halifax. Manhattan's gone. New Jersey, gone. Bayonne, gone. Brooklyn shipyard, everything. They knew that. The Coast Guard people knew that who were in charge. They had to get that ship out of, they called on a tug and they called off the fireboats for a while who stood by. The tugs tied up and now they wanted volunteers to serve in that boat to help put the fire out on board with hoses, which they had on board, they had water. Again, all the hands go up. What is it about people? I'll volunteer, I'll volunteer. This one lieutenant who ran the crew who got on board the ship. There was one guy coming up the ladder, his name was Whittick, and he said, no, 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 you're getting married next week. You go home. The rest of the guys, what did they do? They get the bill, bill folds out, they take the rings off, and they hand them. They know they're not coming back. They gave all the belongings to a few people that were left on the dock and took off. But thank God these tugboats were able to get it out of there and take it into a, more of an open sea area. And they sank it. No explosion. Uh, next. Now I was a young man, 16. I was in the British Merchant Navy. I was on a I was on a small tanker. And I found out from the radio man, I was a radio telegraphy, and I found out from the head, I was a, remember I was a cadet, 16, 17, and the radio guy who was in charge of me was telling the whole crew this story. We had a bar on board, I sitting around drinking, telling stories, you know, couldn't smoke. If you want to smoke, you go in the bath, right, the stern. Well, he was telling the story about the enterprise. Anybody know what zirconium is? Anybody with zirconium? It's a real powerful metal that's used to coat rods in uh, the atomic rods that go into a make, the making of atomic energy, but very, very important material. They didn't say that was on the manifest. This comes later. They had Volkswagens, typewriters, iron, they had all kinds of stuff on this boat. And one of the fiercest storms between the Irish Sea and the English coast, the west coast of England, a phenomenal storm. The Flying Enterprise uh, had the call because she was listing. She was, they felt maybe a lot of the cargo had moved, listing badly. They sent out the turmoil, very famous tugboat from England. Their problem was, getting people off the, they had 20 passengers. There was an American ship out here. You could see the signals. People wondered what she was there because there were a lot of British ships around that Captain Carson wouldn't allow to come even close. Everybody wondered about that afterwards, especially Coast Guard people and people investigating the situation. They got a guy named Dancy to leave the tug and find his way onto that ship after they got all of the passengers off. They all went over to the American ship. They, the American ship sent them back butter, which they greased the tow line, the, the tow bit on the bow of the boat, and they managed to get a line to the ship, to the flying enterprise. Now they're pulling her through the storm. There's two men on board, Dancy, and Captain Kurt Carlson, Swede, I think. Could have been Swede or Norwegian. They're all kind of the same to me. 
Yeah, we're all kind of Norse. I think he was Danish. Wasn't he Danish? Maybe? Could have been Danish. Yeah, could have been Danish. I said, I don't know if they were Swedish. Neat guy, I think he was Danish. Yeah, to me, they're all pretty much the same. No, they, they all raped and pillaged my country. <laughs> were you there? That's why I always blame those people. You raped and pillaged my people, bastards. <laughs> Anyway, Dancy and Kurt, Captain Kurt uh, Carlson, uh, they managed to get the tow line. The ship now it's going down. They're not making headway. They're not doing well. Dancy manages to get off the ship. The captain stays on. He stayed on until that funnel came right into the water and he crawled down the funnel, got off that ship and he was safe. He was a hero in London. Now that's something you can look up because I saw that part of my research on newsreels, all British newsreels. And here he is coming in with everybody's cheering and ticker tape. The reason that the ships weren't allowed to help the British ships is that investigators thought that there might have been on the manifest something called zirconium, which was a secretive material very special alloys used in coating rods of uh, atomic energy rods. And they felt that that's the reason that she didn't let anybody on board. Anyway, didn't go anywhere, of course. Captain Kirsten, Kirsten was offered $250,000 by a British newspaper for his story. He was offered over a million dollars by Hollywood for his story. So here I am in the back of this tanker, smoking a cigarette, looking exactly at the same coordinates that the, that the uh, sparks told me. That's where the ship actually went down. Wasn't only where the ship went down because Captain Carlson, who led a life that wasn't unbelievable or extraordinary. He could have been, you can imagine, super rich, but he stayed incognito until he died. And I was overlooking the very place where his remains were scattered. What's next? I was also smoking for 17. I threw my ash in there. Thank God you guys are saying the last one, I'm running a little late, but we started late. Huh? Give me a break. This is a boat I found in Ireland. I found two of them. Uh, I painted them later. I just kind of liked them. Um, I liked the rust. Now, there's one thing us maritime painters love, huh? and most seafarers hate us for this. Hate us. We love rust. We live off of rust. We live off of rotted timbers. We like to paint garbage. But if you own a house that's like that, or you're a mariner, or you're a sea captain, you hate me for thinking that way. But that's where, look at the rust on this thing. It lives, it lives and breathes. This. Anyway, I, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna answer that. You know what? It's time up. Anyway, that's the end of my story. I thank you for listening. Thank you.